That's last. Back up there so I can see it. Today we're very happy to have Kong Hong Luo. Okay, <laughs> I apologize. Um, uh, telling us about toroidal structure, uh, sorry, universal structures of toroidal casimir energy in CFTs, which I look forward to understanding what that means. And you're working with Matt, right? Is that? No, no my, my uh, advisor is Sergey Dukmovsky. Oh, uh, sorry. This work is based on my work with Dukmovsky. Okay, I got everything totally wrong. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Do we have uh, any visitors today? I don't see any few people. Any visitors today? Want to choose some slides? Yes. All right. In that case, let's begin. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. So uh, today I'm going to to talk about the universal structure of toroidal and CFT, and this work is uh, based on work with Stephen uh, at the end of last year. So I'm going to split my talk into five parts. <coughs> and so first I'm going to introduce the motivation, like uh, why we should care about the Tasmanian deep or torus. And then in the second part I'm going to uh, Review some the setup of uh, CFT and torus, and also some basic properties that we should see immediately about the cosmic energy, like water invariance. And then the main part is the uh, part three that I'm going to introduce the uh, EFT argument that is going to give us in the thin force limit uh, this universal expansion of the cosmic energy. So I've heard it. Uh, written down the main results so that you can first get going about what it looks like and like how but how powerful the conformal symmetry is it. as you can see that uh, it actually has only two perturbative terms and along with some well non-perturbative terms so this is already quite amazing because we kind of have a finite transition of the perturbative terms and in section, uh, in part four, I'm going to interpret all those terms that appear in these universal formulas. And at the end of the talk, like already, I'm going to give you a few simple examples, like how these formulas are realized in well, some cases. Uh, okay, so let's start with the motivation. So, well, as we all know, that conformal symmetry are very strong constraints on the theories. And well, there have been a lot of studies of the conformal field theories during the last century. But uh, at this moment, I think there are still, uh, people still only know very few about what happens for conformal field theories on a general manifold. But what is it going to be one of the uh, main motivations is to study the conformal data so well in flat space time as we may know that uh, all the endpoint correlators of local uh, of, uh, local operators can be determined by uh, the scaling dimension and the uh, uh, the three point the OP coefficient of all the primary operators. So one natural question to ask is that well are these all the data one need to determine one CFT? Well uh, I think this might still be an open question, but the answer is probably not because well in higher but well, on general manifold, especially in higher dimensions, well there could be many new well, safe data and also observables that appear. For example, there could be uh, non-trivial holonomies along those uh, cycles. And also, uh, there are new observables. Like, in like on a general manifold, the one-point function will not vanish uh, like in the flat space time. So, Can you just repeat yeah. what delta 2 and CIJK are? 
uh, the delta is the uh, scaling dimension of the uh, of operator. Well, scaling dimension is like uh, the, uh, oh, the delta i, I see. Yeah, delta i. Where so usually when we have the, this uh, dilatation operator, which when we act on uh, some some uh, op operator, i is going to be as uh, the scaling dimension. Well, this uh, in some sense could be also uh, treat as the energy. Well, I'm going to uh, talk about this uh, more later. And this is the uh, so-called OG coefficient, which is uh, when we, one consider the uh, uh, OG uh, so is the OG expansion around uh, one closed form. So that one can uh, something like this, which means that one can kind of write the uh, two uh, write the product of two operators into an expansion of only one operators. Well, this is kind of a trick to use the endpoint correlators to. And minus one point correlators in the CFT. Well, well, okay. yeah, the, just I just want to say that in first space science, this is these two data are all, all, all we need to calculate the uh, uh, point correlators. Well, of course, uh, in general medical, we are not sure whether this is true. So, uh, well. Yeah, maybe a bit of question of semantics. But would you say how to distinguish basically when they say there are different ways to put the same CFT on a curved manifold, or these are really two different CFTs? Because for me it sounds like if you have the same set of deltas and Cs, I would say that's really it's a choice of how the CFT can be put on the manifold, but I wouldn't call it really different CFTs. Uh, well, there could be some new observables that is not immediately related to this data. For example, this, uh, I think maybe this example I'm going to describe is one of them, like some of the coefficients here is, well, it may be related to this data in, in some non-trivial way, but it's not just at first glance obvious. So there could be some, some new observables in the, on a general medical like this, that, you know, that one might be not sure how to kind of put them into this. Uh, plus data. Are you to tell us how C1 and C2 are related to these numbers for especially CFTs? Sorry? Are you going to tell us how C1 and C2 coefficient uh, are, are, are yes. related to delta i and cijk for specific examples? Or? Well, yeah, I'm going to uh, uh, discuss this in text uh, in house four, but I think the relation is quite unsure. But there is a relation for specific examples. Sorry? There is a relation for a specific examples you consider, right? There's well, a universal general. relation. Okay, that's a, a yeah. universal relation for all, all the okay. Yeah. C1, but not for C2. Okay. So there's a universal relation between C1 uh, and this delta 2 and CIJK that you want to reduce, are, which are kind of the flat space OPE data. They determine how briefly correlation functions of local operators. This delta are roughly labeled in the species of the operator. And the CIJK are the building blocks for um, you know, correlation functions or fluctuations in individual operators. And the magic of, CB, of, uh, of CFT is that when you do this naive product, uh, the right hand side is a convergent expression. So actually, it's a very powerful way to you know, build correlation functions of arbitrary operators using just CIJK and, and the information about what kind of species you use. And that thing is true for anything like that, a relationship like that exists for any of these theories in flat space. That's right, the universal space. Okay. So that's that's what Sohan means that this information delta and C specifies completely the CFT of flat space. And then he's now gonna try to see from the a more general manifold, maybe we'll consider one example, whether there are additional data. That's not obviously measured by this uh, 
so yeah, in this talk, I'm gonna uh, go one step towards this goal, which is uh, we want to study, like in general, a Hilbert space uh, on a on like non non spherical manifold. <coughs> So, well, we don't have a uh, general answer of this question. And this year, we, uh, in this course, we are actually using a more uh, a simplest sample, which is T2 cross R to the D minus 3. So, well, in, so in this question, the uh, first obstacle that we will encounter is that we don't have a simple operator state correspondence to help us uh, relate this uh, states of Hilbert space to uh, the operators on the on the on the flat space. So in general, uh, in on flat space time, this uh, so-called state operator correspondence that uh, claims that there is a one-to-one -one uh, correspondence between states uh, in the Hilbert space of a sphere to uh, the local operators. Uh, well, maybe I should just erase phi, which is uh, in d dimensional space time. But this, well, we don't have the Analogy of this thing, right? It is not an uh, obvious analogy of this thing on the torus. So, well, even for the ground state of the Hilbert space, which is the main, um, main subject I'm going to discuss today, you know, we don't know like, immediately how to prepare such a state from just past integral. But it, we, sh we should compare to this case that we do know how to prepare prepare a state on a sphere, which is just by doing path integration in the form with no uh, local operator insertions. So, well, but maybe just by uh, studying the properties of this Casimir energy, we may be able to go the other way around, just to guess what, well, what might be the state operator respondent. But uh, okay, but he, here our main goal is just to study the properties of this Casimir uh, energy, and this is like the reasons that why we want to look at it. Well, well, uh, on the chorus there are few advantages that we want uh, that we want to study. Uh, for example, it is flat, and also it has. The so-called modular invariance uh, that I'm going to uh, explain in the, uh, in the part four, and also it is directly related to uh, the manifold of S one cross R to D minus one, when we take the one of the side of the torus to be much longer than another one. Well, and there have been some studies on that manifold as well oh, already, so we can kind of make connection between this, the results on both sides. Uh, so here, you're going to consider a CFT on torus and one side by some other external direction. And well, because we, we are interested in the uh, Hilbert space on torus, so we take one of the R direction to be the time. And here, uh, the metric of a torus is given by this expression. So, Han, did, did you um, tell us why? Uh, what is what is relation between the quantities of field and cash energy that uh, people know about? The usual customary effect and relation to this cash energy. Uh, 
real and imaginary part of the uh, of this size model. Uh, oh. So, sorry, what, what is beta? Beta is the length of the side. Or? Yeah, beta is this. L2 is the length of the other side, right? What does L2? Do? L2 is the length of Yeah, L2 is the length of this, okay. of this side. Yes, I'm just short of the And I, I'm going to also uh, uh, use another form which is more suited for calculation. So here L is another uh, size of another circle here given by beta tau two. So, so yeah, so tau two kind of like the length of the perpendicular side. And uh, if you're interested in the Hilbert space. Uh, on this method. Where one can just directly relate the uh, uh, welcome energy uh, by the partition function because we are in the so why t two times r three? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, we can directly relate the welcome energy to the partition function because so if you take the t as the formal uh, volume of the time direction. Take to infinity. We get this relation from uh, what is called dynamics. So here, well, the t is like the like the length of uh, in the time direction. And the function on the t minus t two times t minus two. Yeah, sorry. And then, well, in general, this this itself has a mass scale, which is given by the uh, the size modulus here. You write down the uh, area of this uh, area of the uh, torus at A, and you need to because now it is in the uh, scale invariant. Theory, so we can just strip off this uh, scale and focus on the dimension that's observable, which we call uh, the curly E here. So, uh, in general, all the dimension is observable uh, in. In the CFT on the torus only depends on the uh, shape modulus tau. And in general, they also have the so called uh, modular invariants. Which means that, well, because the tau kind of, well, we need the uh, A and tau to specify the torus, but sometimes there might be some redundancy in this specification. So, uh, for example, for the bosonic theory, so find is is he vacuum positive or negative? Because in general, this in E and M, the calcium energy is famous because it's negative. Yes. So E vacuum is positive or negative here? Because to negative. make a more analogy, I would like the leak epsilon to be negative. I mean, it's a calcium energy. Oh, this one. Oh, yes. Here I use the convention that the, the curly E is positive. Curly E is. Clearly, it's positive. Yeah, just in, the in usual terminology, the Cassini energy will turn out to be negative, as you would expect for compact uh, volumes. But then in this case, it's positive. But no, he's uh, he's just showing on the minus sign. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's actually an open <laughs> question, like uh, whether it's a general statement if you're on like on a compact space manifold, whether the quantity energy is always negative. There's no counterexample, but there's also no general proof. It's a question whether you have quantum fields confined in the compact cavity, whether it's preferred to, you know, to shrink or expand. Whether the pressure on the wall of the cavity, whether it's going inside or outside. 
special paramounts with very long yeah, retention. So here, here uh, is talking about bosons, and for fermions, you'll be looking at the, um, the anti crowd bond information. Yes, yes. The NT is not worth it. He is, he is the volume he introduced for the time direction. It's not right. a yeah, time direction. Is not, uh, it's the direction of one of the half. So it's a yes, okay. yes, but how is it related to the, the other things that we have defined before? <coughs> uh, no, it's defined by itself. It's an it's a actual direction. So it has the spatial directions t2 times r t minus 3. Mm -hmm. And they call the formal time direction so the length of the formal time direction capital T. Mm -hmm. Actual direction, <laughs> not including t two times r t minus three. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, uh, I don't have. And so the so the modular invariance uh, so for bosonic theory we have this modular group. Well, well, when we act on tau. And this actually gives us the same torque. So we can make a sample, which is a T transformation that they come to uh, the shift tau plus one. And so if, if they have a torus of this shape, this is going to give us a new torus. That is a new torus that is of this this shape, but they are actually the same because you're just, you're just choosing different basic vectors. So yeah, this is uh, so called modular invariant. So because they have they actually describing the same force, so we also expect the observables that is a function of tau to be invariant under this uh, modular transform. So we should have this relation. And while well, we also want some other uh, properties of this uh, curly E, like because we want the safety to be unitary, so it should be real. And also, if there's a parity, it's a parity symmetry, it will actually uh, take the size of the tau 1. Well, so these are some, some of the properties that we can kind of see immediately from the CFT on torus. Then one question to ask is like, uh, are there any other constraints from conformal symmetry? And the answer is yes. And uh, that is why we, uh, in the next, in the next form, so I'm going to introduce the CFT algorithm. want to consider the partition functions on the torus and we actually have different ways of interpreting this this quality for example we can choose one of the or uh, sorry we can choose the uh, beta to be the time direction which is the, the thermal circle so we can trace over the Hilbert space uh, the circle times the R R two D minus two. And this is gonna give us the uh, thermal energy. Uh, uh, th sorry, thermal free energy on, on this manifold. Well, on this well, on the other hand, we can also choose one of the R direction to be to be the time directions. So we can have another uh, interpretation, which is trace over the cube space on the torus. Well, and in 
in this case, this just gives us the vacuum energy on the photons. What is P? Sorry, what is P? Uh, P is the uh, momentum operator that kind of generates this uh, this chip. Sorry, Why I, is should, it? I should have to okay. count one. Mm -hmm. uh, that, in that case, we also have this uh, cross them in the metric, so I need, I need to uh, trace over P as well. So this gives the uh, vacuum energy. And this gives us a relation between the free free energy on on S one times R D minus two to the vacuum energy on the poles. So the Hamiltonian in the first line and second line are different, right? Are Hamiltonian yeah, different yeah, yeah. spatial magnitudes. They are defined on different yeah, same spatial magnitudes. Uh, yeah, I just kind of neglect the label. So you obviously know, you don't have vacuum degeneracy? Sorry? Is it obvious that you don't have vacuum degeneracy? There can be vacuum degeneracy. Say that again? There can be vacuum degeneracy. But be. it's not going to affect what you will say next. So what Ahmed is saying is that in the second equality, um, it's not necessary to e to the minus T V E E vacuum. It could come with a coefficient mm. that takes into account that you have, may have a degenerate vacuum. Yes. Yeah, I don't think it, well, it, it should be set subtly. No, it's because you will you will take the log and you factor out the power of p. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Uh, and the, yeah, it used the small l to uh, to denote the free energy density. <laughs> and well, then we kind of think we are going to consider the symbol limit, where we have a hierarchy between these two uh, circles. Well, when how goes to Ein infinity is the equivalent of saying that uh, one uh, one radius of circle is much more than another one. Then here we can try to compute the effective action from the uh, from from the KK reduction of this uh, of this circle. <coughs> Because here, this this circle is much smaller than another one. So, in the three swing torus limit, we can just do the magnification and do a dimensional reduction, which is equivalent of uh, integrating over all the massive all the massive modes induced by this compactification. And because well, we are on the CFT, so the only mass scales that is introduced here is given by the scale of this of this circle which is heavy in this in this limit so but I also know that so the, there's the relation between the effective action and the free energy density because they all come from, they, they can all be used to compute their uh, function function So the next step is to uh, try to uh, write down the effective action of the dimensional reduction. So well, now that we have integrated out all the uh, massive holes, we will only uh, have those local terms that come from the functionals of the background field, the background matrix. So there will be terms like this
where the well, this is the Ricci tensor of the uh, metric on base metal, and uh, this is the strength, uh, field strength of this very photon. Remaining tensor in general. Or is remaining tensor in general? You, just, you should say it's a schematic form for the. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah. And by dimensional analysis, there will also be uh, the beta factor. Well, in, in principle, there could be also uh, the gap list, the gap list modes that is not uh, in the grid over, over. But let's focus on the first term here. So, can you say again what, is, what metric is G? Sorry? G is the metric of the torus. Or no? But G is the metric after the compactification. Okay. So, you, you can write down the, the whole metric like yeah. this and then. Uh, after complication, the G is like the yeah. Yeah, measure of E minus one variable. What is capital F of A? Wait, what does that mean? After compactification, so you have it, a you have a torus. It's got a metric. Yeah, and I compactified on the the short side where I see the the direction of the beta. So this is this is actually the effective action of one last dimension. So we have uh, from a d-dimensional uh, action, I do the compactification on one on the, on the short side, but here beta is the short side. And compactification does what? Well, what is the word? Uh, so uh, let's say you have the, uh, this action on d on d dimension, and you kind of put uh, one of the uh, directions to compactify. For example, so this is that direction. I denote it as T. Okay. But, and then you kind of only leave all those uh, because you're integrating all the massive modes. So uh, in general, you can have all these fields. That is uh, like a Fourier transform of the All those fields that as a function of t, you kind of get a Fourier transform. And then you only leave all those fields that is independent of independent of t. Okay. But do you have in mind here that you introduce now some kind of uh, curved metric also the background metric because I otherwise all R's are just zero in that expression. Yes, right? yes. That's, 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 that's the key point. Some other general case. So here question. you have in mind that it's not just on the torus, but there is some that's background right. metric which introduces on the mm -hmm. torus, which is non-trivial. Well, which is that metric? No, that metric has that's one which has is flat, right? That has yeah, not have any R. He will he will come to that. Right. So when you wrote this expression as effect. Oh yeah, this right. this is in general when you do a compactification on the general metal, you have some expression yeah. like this with some non-trivial uh, Riemann tensor, and well, but in our yeah, but let me first explain this to Mike to so understand it. So well, I certainly understand the second, the last line there, <laughs> uh, but 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 you're just saying that. That this S you're defining is some integral over some dimensions that for some reason just yeah I you, you throw away just, all the dependence. You're allowed to integrate, it's meaningful to integrate over some dimension, and what's left over depends only on the other dimensions. Yeah. And somehow that's a that's a useful thing to do. Yeah, that's that's because uh, in this competitification, in general, you get all this uh, this uh, field with uh, mass of this of this form. So when the beta is is small, they are in general very heavy. So we can integrate them out to get the effective action. That is a general case when you try to do a dimensional reduction on a small circle. It's a yeah. The, 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 so there's the a general relation between functional theory and B dimension to one in one lower dimension. 
the relation is by KK is by this complication. And in, in doing so, fields in one higher dimension decompose into a whole you know, sum over you know, Fourier modes. Well, they dimension. always do that right. because right. that's what periodic functions yes. do. Yes. <laughs> and this is a so typically it's a it's a it's you don't gain anything by just rewriting your your single field in D dimension into an infinite sum, right. which you can always do. You I don't see. gain anything, but you gain something when the when the uh, circle you compactify on is small. And the reason you gain something like that is because when you do the Fourier mode decomposition, uh, you can actually uh, do the path to go over this entire tower in a very kind of uh, uh, compact way. Okay, you're saying that only is that somehow saying on, the only significant phi's are that's right, the low ones. ones because all the other ones are so massive their fluctuations are stamped, which means right. having to go over them would be super easy. Meaning those these coefficients are just very small. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, you need this lowest KK mode because it has some inherent scale. Like if I just had my CFT living on just a flat space time cross, uh, just a circle, yes. nothing interesting would happen. No, no. Wouldn't so the be? the scale so. So, so there are two things that will happen. Um, so first of all, you're right, the beta is only scaled for the CFT, when you consider CFT on this curved geometry. Um, the zero mode, the phi naught, would contribute to something that someone calls s gapless. But the first piece will come from entirely from the uh, non-zero modes. But because it's a CFT, before you put on this geometry, the first piece will take a very simple form, even though it looks complicated for the moment. I guess my question is, why, why, why do you want to do that? Like what happens if I just naively do, you know, try to compute a Casimir yeah. energy on a, just a circle? You will get, you will get what what the uh, will write. I'll give you the first term C one. You know, from the gap list. You always get the same thing, but here you'll you put on a circle, you create a gap, and then yeah. uh, that will lead to a particular term that the uh, wrote on the right hand side of S E F, and that will explain the C one term. Now you have additional circle. But you have C2 two and other okay, okay, so it's because of C two that you want that other. So what the what the going back again to what uh, Casimir did originally, he was doing the Fermat field, and he got the first term C one Fermat field. And what Songhao will tell us is that uh, there's a general technology allow you to actually fix the C two and also the entire uh, subject field covers. So can you show us for a second the, the previous blackboard? So uh, yeah, so we have like two ways to calculate the partition function and using a different uh, sort of thermodynamic ensemble in one way we're gonna basically say temperature is very low and we are gonna or the beta is very sorry temperature is very large beta yeah. is very close to zero yes. so with one side we're gonna do some tricks basically take out some heavy modes and that will give us the answer of let's say the first or the second way of calculating that trace Yes, something like that. Like, this, this, this is to say that the plasma energy is related to the, the pure energy on on this manifold. And th this is where we kind of start doing the kick, uh, kick reduction. So if we do the KK reduction in the top part, which is in the shades, because it corresponds to the same partition function, we will know evacuum. Like we do KK on the first part, and even though we do KK, we will know the true evacuum. Because uh, because what I so how would explain even though I calculate everything in the limit where beta is much smaller than L, like in the very high temperature limit, they will it will be able to resum the entire contribution to suppressing beta. So the expression I wrote in the beginning that's the exact expression that holds for any tau. Yeah, that's my second question. So even though we because the, this expansion limit? term by term naturally comes from in, the, in that limit, but it will be able to resum everything. So yeah, well, after the dimensional reduction, we get these general sums of uh, perturbative terms. But on torus, as I uh, mentioned before, we actually get all, uh, curvatures all to zero. So in immediately, the only leftover term is the uh, terms that with n equals to m equals to zero. So we kind of have uh, well. Here because they are directly related to the free energy. So I'm just writing the free energy, which is um, well, but 
leading term is just given by uh, the term here with n equals to m equals zero. And that's, yeah, that's because we are on torus. So that's why we want to do this, uh, do the calculation on this on this manifold. And then, well, because we still have another another circle here, just uh, with a larger radius than theta, but we can still well, which which gives us this gap is small, but we can still use the same trick after dimensional reduction because well, all the other directions are kind of different. So with the same trick, we also, we can get the sub leading term using the same uh, argument in one last dimension. So this is gonna give us. Uh, This form, where no, is oh, sorry. Well, this this is this just comes from the uh, AK reduction of uh, another another circle, which is larger. And well, also there will be some non-perturbative terms. Don't come up, but uh, we kind of we have encountered all the possibilities that we can write to the perturbative terms here. So which only include two two terms. So while the number perturbative terms, uh, as I will explain later, it still comes from the world line instantons. Uh, basically, in the reading as this massive KK modes traveling around the large circles. Well, this is the first line of this board. Only will give you perturbative part, right? Huh? The first line of the board. Yes. This, this only gives you perturbative part. Right? Yes. But non perturbative part, you have to do it using some other formula. And, okay, so this is. So we already got this uh, universal formula. And then I haven't write out this uh, exponential terms yet. So we can. <laughs> Uh, go to part four. Basically, what does C1 and C2 mean? So, in general, as we are already seen, actually it's the coefficient that comes in the uh, free energy uh, on the circle. Uh, free, uh, the, the free energy on a finite temperature, I would say. Which, so we can write it down more explicitly. Well, free energy can be given by the uh, partition function. Just by dimensional analysis, we can get this term. But also, this is what will appear if we consider the one point function of the stress tensor at finite temperature, which means that well, on, on just, we, we only have one circle and the arc cross R to D minus one. Well, this is gonna give us. Uh, well, just by dimensional analysis as well. Well, in general, we are, here I use the notation that the BT is the one point coefficient that comes from the stress tensor. And we can also, inter well, this is actually equivalent to energy, uh, energy at finite temperature which we can use the positivity of the energy 
to constrain to constrain that one point coefficient. that uh, it is more than zero and actually the one point function also gives us the uh, addition, uh, sorry also also gives us this free energy so we kind of have the same bounds on the C1 Well, but basically, we can we kind of we can relate this C one to the uh, to the CFT data on uh, on the flat space, uh, which is the scaling dimension and the uh, OP coefficient. Hmm. So we can consider. Well, this uh, the CFT at finite temperature can be considered as a limit of uh, of this manifold. But we already know that by state operator correspondence for the Hilbert space on, on the sphere has one-to-one -one, uh, map to the local operators. So we have this uh, relation between these two partial functions. This is given by the trace of the Hilbert space on the sphere. Which we also integrate, uh, we trace over the scaling dimension, and in the in, in the limit when the radius goes to infinity, we obtain the partition functions uh, of s one cross uh, r to the d minus one, which we already know the answer of the uh, free energy. So well, if you stare at this, uh, this relation, we kind of have the relation between the one-point coefficient, which is well has related to C one here as uh, related to C one, and also it is related to the. Uh, Operator spectrum on the first space time, just from, from this expression. And we see that in this limit, the main contribution to the trace comes from the high, high dimension operators. So this is kind of like an analogy of the Cardi's formula in 2D. We have a, well, this the BT, also C1 here plays a role like the central charge on two dimensions, which Kind of characterize the high dimensional density of the operators. So it can also be treated like a, a, a degrees of freedom of, of the theory. So we, uh, we claim that this can be characterized, uh, this, this specifies the use of freedom on the d-dimensional CFT. And similarly, we have the same conclusion for C2. So just this time, it, is, it comes from the d-minus one-dimensional CFT. 
So with, with this relation, we see that C1 is uh, directly related to the uh, operator spectrum on the flat space side. So, so it's related to the scan dimension, but the relation is less straightforward because here the C, uh, for C2, for C2 here, it is instead related to the operator spectrum of one last dimension. So this actually comes from uh, this actually implies that the C2 is a uh, very non trivial observable uh, in a D dimensional CFT. And well, there's one like one evidence like to say that this is like between the figures of freedom of the theory is that uh, it, it will become zero only when we do the computations on the topological uh, on the topological theory. Okay, so, and then the next step, I, I also try to say a bit about the non productive terms. So you see that it actually, uh, I, I mentioned that it comes from the uh line instant terms that, uh, that characterize the traveling of the KK modes around the uh, large circles. Much. Okay, <laughs> oh, I'm about to end. So, here uh, there's a, a systematic way of calculating such world line instantor. This is called the world line path integral. I'm just going to write out the formula here. And you can see that it is very straightforward that we can obtain such uh, exponential terms. So here, uh, T is the so-called uh, Schrodinger parameter that kind of measures the total probe time of a massive particle that's going around uh, in one period. And you see we are integrating over the, uh, the path of these particles where uh, it is periodic. And uh, we integrate it uh, by the weight of the work line line action. Uh, for people who are not familiar with this, uh, this mechanism, uh, this, this formalism, so here this is the wall line action of a, of a particle, and here you can Kind of imagine it as the uh, like the coupling to the gauge potential. Where here the gauge potential is from the quiet photon of the KK reduction. <coughs> what is and the mass of the particle? Sorry. What is the mass of this? Well, this is photon dependent. Because it enters so like that. That enters GIJ. Or no, so GIJ what? is the yeah, GIJ. metric. Yeah. What? Does, where does it enter? So. Oh, you mean the mask? Yes, the mask is here. Why do you support line instantons? Why don't you just uh, compute the free energy of this uh, theory? Sorry? Like this is equivalent of computing log determinant yes, of yes. our field theory. Exactly. But why do you want to use support line instantons instead of just directly computing this free energy? Well, because uh, we we kind of expect when we have one circle, uh, 
where we have one circle and we have some massive moles, then we can also expect such more line instances to appear in the non-perturbative effect. I, I understand, but like because for small beta, uh, there's a semi-quantum approximation to that free energy. And that semi-quantum approximation, the semi-quantum oh, cycles are most obvious. Okay, okay, I see, I got that. For one line instance, I'm just some semi-quantum Okay. But that just neglects no interaction between them? It's Here, it's he's not. just trying to do like qualitatively forgetting about interaction, just trying to explain the exponentials. Mm -hmm. The interactions will tell you about his G vector. Is yeah. one of the goals that's uh, exponential. That's right. We, we should probably let him wrap up. Oh, uh, very good. Well, this, uh, this part is well can be computed <coughs> from a uh, set of one approximation. And here, well, it is much simpler, simpler because the gauge potential is a constant. So all the set of one approximation is just uh, constant motion. And we, we need another uh, winding winding number to characterize the well traveling around the tra traveling around the circle which is the end here so here we see that uh, we kind of obtain this exponential uh, number of effect which is quite similar to the formula I present here it just well here, this number of effects kind of also include multi instances. And the G function here is captures all the fluctuations around those uh, instances and also possible interactions between these different instances. So, but, but this term is perturbative in the sense that it, it is given by all the uh, power functions of tau 2. So, yeah, I may get to give a very simple example. Just, uh, we, we should probably make sure to wrap up just in a minute or two. Yeah, very simple right. example. Okay, I'll just give the example of a free skater, I think. So for a free skater, uh, you only need to uh, sum over all the moles, which is uh, form of like this and which can be uh, uh, regularized as the uh, Eisenstein function and so I did know the item side functions here as D star. Which uh, can be defined as a, a modular sum. Well, I don't think you have time to introduce that function. So why not? <laughs> why not just explain, like in your expression, what are the key features in the free theory so you can. Okay. Okay. I think that I just got to write out the Fourier decomposition of this uh, Eisenstein function. We can already see that uh, the productive terms, like th there are only two productive terms, and they are both functions of d and functions of d minus one, which 
exactly corresponds to our interpretation that so this kappa is actually related to the free energy at fine temperature. So and similarly for this 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 term here, and here we also have the number uh, number derivative terms that is in the exponential form. Well, for people who are not familiar with the Bessel function, when uh, tau two goes to infinity, the well, it will like goes like this. So we kind of uh, reproduce the exponential forms when uh, in the sin towards limit. So this is like a realizations of our universal formula uh, as an expansion at the sin towards limit. Okay, so <laughs> any questions? So just so I'm clear on what, what you've done here, in this last case, you can, ex you can explicitly show that all of this, and that's very significant because it fits, it is in the form you say, all things have to fit into. Yes, yes, this okay. is a case that we can do the explicit calculation. Yeah. And we do uh, kind of verify that it satisfies the uh, asymptotic expansion that there is something funny with the with the exponent of t two, which I don't understand. But in the Bessel function, tau tau two. Yeah, here because the Bessel function when tau. Well, you, you see. No, this? I mean the second term. T two yes. to the t minus one over two versus one minus zero. Uh, <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. All right. As long as it's a typo. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It's too. All right. Good. Good, then, then my understanding yeah. is probably yeah, as yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are there other questions? Is it, is there any condition so that the non-perturbative ring is way, way smaller than the two first terms? Like tau, no. tau 2 has to be a big number, otherwise uh, oh. calling it non-perturbative is risky. Like what is the condition on, on on what type of torus you have to have in order for the second term to be less less relevant? No, this, this is the expansion that we kind of assume how to much rather than one. So the, the, all the number of ah, okay, terms are highly exponential. Right. Ah, yeah, it was there, sorry. Yes. It was with the this, is, this does not hold for on, on a whole complex plane, of course. But it's just uh, the conditions that how to is much rather than one. That's, that's assuming you can do this, like dilute instanton gap approximation, right? Yes. Like you don't have interactions, that's so you do. Yeah, here I do the calculation, uh, calculations with that assumption. I, I guess, how do you know that that's a good assumption here? Like, I, it's often used for like early universe calculation of like bubble formations and stuff where it seems sort of reasonable. How would I know that that's a good approximation here? You're summing over all of the corrections to the double uh, approximation in this, in this formula. Of course, in practice, to calculate those corrections are very difficult. So sometimes it's able to do it. Not in the free scalar case. In the free scalar case, you can actually do that exactly. The dilute instant approximation is exact in the free theory case because the instant do not uh, interact with one another. In the interacting case, it's much harder, but uh, Tohan is able to solve it for some interacting models and verify the same expression. Yeah, and also here, I think the set of point approximation is good when uh, we have this condition, which is actually equivalent to, to this condition. But it's but this, of course, just the free case. Uh, we, we haven't introduced any of that. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah, I think you want to, yeah, if you want to do it again, you probably want to, you know, focus on the big picture and the more like notions are.